one big thing that I can't stress enough is what I've learned over the years with teams specifically is if your systems are complicated, specifically on the follow-up end of it, salespeople won't do mm. it. They just won't. Mm. They're not good at that. What they're good at is getting in front of people and really, you know, shaking and baking and converting. But when you when you're we talk follow-up with them, they don't want anything to do with it unless it's simplistic and they're rewarded for it. Hey friends, welcome back to the CarrotCast podcast where we help you dial in your online marketing to help you build businesses of freedom and impact. I've got my guest today here with me, Mr. Phil Shaver. Welcome to the podcast, man. How you doing? I am doing great. Thank you for having me. Good, good, man. Good to hear. Good to see you again. Um, so in case y'all missed it, October is deal closers month at Carrot. And you know, Carrot's good at helping you, is great at helping you generate motivated seller leads, but we want you to be able to close the leads as well. So uh, this month is all about helping you with your negotiation and follow-up skills. And uh, what Phil and I were just talking about right before we hit record was that, you know, these skills are, he said, these skills are much more important in this market than it was a couple of years ago when things were easier. So there's not a better time to hone in your negotiation skills. So anyways, go to carrot.com slash close to get all of our negotiation, follow up content and enjoy uh, deal closes month at carrot. Um, but anyways, uh, Phil has done an amazing job. He's been an agent for 18 years, sold over 2,500 homes, is running a seven-figure agency, and he's done a great job of executing what we call the hybrid model. And so he's not throwing away leads. And so we want to have a conversation about uh, what it looks like to deal with motivated seller leads and how he's trained agents to deal with motiv motivated seller leads. Because we were... Uh, Phil, you and I were having a conversation at Care Camp a while back, and and you were telling me investors they they tend to just not do anything with these leads; or they throw them away because they're they're scared to pass them off. Correct me if I'm wrong. You're saying that you're they're scared to pass them off to agents because the agents just don't know how to handle a motivated seller lead traditionally, and so it seems like you've done a pretty good job of of knowing how to handle those leads. Tell me about a little bit about your backstory, like. You know, what got you into real estate and then when did, when did this whole hybrid thing come up and why'd you take a look at this hybrid model? Okay. So, um, the hybrid model was never on my radar. Um, so when I started real estate about 18 years ago, um, I had a good mentor to start out. I joined his team first and, um, I ended up have, uh, buying a franchise from him, um, a couple of years in my real estate career, um, failed miserably with the franchise. Um, had to file bankruptcy, and then I um, started a different real estate company that um, uh, with two other partners, and we ended up getting this real estate company up to two offices, about 45, 50 agents, um, and then that partnership broke up. Um, I was left with about 20,000 um, bucks, and then I kind of ventured off onto my own, and so my current setup, and again, I've tried a lot of different models, and I've had the ton of agents and all that stuff is my current model is set up very simplistic, um, it meets my lifestyle, I love it. Um, so I have three full-time agents that work with me. These are the people that are very important when it comes to the conversion of the leads. I have a full-time assistant, she's been with me for about eight years, and then I also have a, a part-time gal who does uh, my direct mail that helps me out a ton with my personal notes. Um, mm -hmm. So that's my current setup um, in regards to uh, the real estate, and then, as far as the hybrid model that came about four years ago or so, one thing that I noticed, because I was listing homes for Wells Fargo back in 08 and 09, and there was a ton of short sales going on as well, um, I was teeing up these leads um, for investors to flip, and I take my 3% off a $150,000 uh, deal, and I was happy. I was like, oh, man. And I never paid attention to any of that. Um, and then about four years ago, um, I... I do radio ads and um, one of the uh, clients that called in, um, I met with them and they're like, I, I, don't, I don't, I only want a cash offer. I, I don't, you know, want you to, uh, you know, put it uh, for sale on the retail side. And I was so against buying the homes. I was like, no, you, you got to list it. You'll get more money and all that stuff. And it was almost like I was forced to buy it. And long story short, I ended up buying it. And then all the, um, stuff that I had in my mind that were blocking me from buying it and flipping it had gone away 
after I had successfully flipped it, made a ton of money off of it. And it just hit me. I'm like, what the heck am I doing? I had been teeing these up for other investors and other people for the past 12, 15 years. And I was like, oh my gosh, I have given a ton of money away <laughs> because I never had this on my radar because I had a lot of limiting beliefs or I just, hey, it's going to be too complicated. It's going to take away from my retail side. Um, and so now um, last year was my first year where my retail and my flipping business, my flipping business actually overtook my um, retail business in regards to um, income generated. Um, and it took about three years to get to that point. But that's actually becoming more of a player in my particular business than it was a few years ago. Mm, interesting. Um, so tell me, you, you were talking about how you have three agents on your team right now. You had that mm -hmm. epiphany a while back. Um, did you decide to, uh, like, how'd you come to this business model? Was there a point when you were like, okay, I need to train my agents on, you know, what I went through, what I learned a while back? Good question. So I get this question a lot because I think sometimes there's a thousand different models you can have set up with real estate and investors. And one of the things that I found out, because I've had the big teams before, is I made less money with more agents. And the obvious reason, it's like herding cats. And one of the things that we don't pay attention to is a lot of times when we see growth, we forget one thing is a lot of times growth in this industry means that you're going to have to hire salespeople and salespeople aren't paid hourly. They don't have a salary. So not only are you having to motivate them and train them, you're dealing with their emotional roller coaster of, of conversion is after a couple of years of having a ton of agents. And I was making like 50, $70,000 a year um, having 50 agents. It, <laughs> it kind of hit me when it came down to the, maybe smaller is better. And so one of the things that I um, have, have done, because uh, these agents have been with me 10, 12 years now, is I need to, I, I wanted to create an environment in a, a company that would obviously want them to stick with me, but also at the same time that they can make a ton of money. So I have a setup that works for me and it, you know, it's, um, had them stick around for a while is with those three particular full-time agents. Here's how I have it set up is I, um, I set up all the appointments for them and on the retail side, it's, um, I split 60, 40, 60% to me, 40% for them. Nice part about them. They don't have to pay a penny. They just have to go to the appointments. That's all they have to do. And then, hmm. um, on the flipping side, cause they help me tie down homes as well is for every third home that they tie down. I actually, um, will flip the third one with them and just go 50 50 with them so it's a benefit to them to tie down the homes when they can and then on the retail side i want to make sure that they understand that i'm constantly going to be um finding lead sources and getting them in front of qualified sellers so that helps me a ton because it allows me to track what's the most important to you know get the most amount of money from my businesses um so that's the reason why i have it set up that way it's very simplistic it works for me very well but more importantly I'm not having to deal with 50 other salespeople's emotions and non-conversion. Um, and it's a, a lot easier to track that way. Okay. Uh, no, I'm curious. What, what do you feel like your unique strength is? Are you the, the leader, the organizer, or are you the negotiator, the closer who, you know, you're able to train these people, these agents? That's a good question. So one of the things that stood out to me, I, I went to a Craig Proctor seminar and this was about 12, 14 years ago. And when Craig Proctor does his uh, seminars, um, the one thing that I'll never forget is a question came from the seminar. Someone asked him, hey, um, as you got bigger, because he did TV and radio and a bunch of other marketing, um, did you um, get somebody to answer your phones and um, you know convert your leads for you on the front end? And again, this is my model, but he said, there's one thing that I never, ever gave up. And he's like, that was the first initial contact with the leads. And he's like, the reason for that is because it costs so much. And I was the only one that I trusted to see the conversion mm -hmm. through. And so one of the things that I've done with my model, and I've had, um, you know, lead gen, you know, uh, people before, but with my particular model, I handle all the front end leads and the conversion on them. And then I tee them up on the appointment. And so one of the things that I, I try to make sure, because this is where I feel like we make the most money is if the lead is converted on the front end and if I'm teeing it up for a solid um, appointment for the, the other agent, then I feel like my best proposition to them is I'm going to hook you up with solid appointments that so don't waste your time. 
And then in return, you're going to follow my um, simple follow-up system that we have in place um, to see these leads converted. Because again, you're not going to sign every appointment um, then and there, but there's some simple stuff that I have in place that helps conversion. And one big thing that I can't stress enough is what I've learned over the years with teams specifically is if your systems are complicated, specifically on the follow-up end of it, salespeople won't do mm. it. They just won't. Mm. They're not good at that. What they're good at is getting in front of people and really, you know, shaking and baking and converting. But when you when you're we talk follow up with them, they don't want anything to do with it unless it's simplistic and they're rewarded for it. Simplistic, as in call them uh, this day, this time, every so often, and not oh, make sure you send them this email, this direct mail piece. Is that what you mean? Yeah, and it doesn't even go to that extent. So, like for example, our follow up system is this is one of the ways, um, so when they, they get to their third um, appointment where they're tying down a home and they can flip it with me, I have one simple rule in place in order for them to be eligible for that flip, is I go through our database and I'm gonna pick three random leads that you had appointments with. All I'm looking for is notes and a future follow-up. If I go through three leads and one of them doesn't have one of those things, you're not doing that flip with me. However, if I do go through three leads and they're three for three and they have the notes and follow up, we'll flip the home together. But here's the thing I'm getting at is my expectation on follow up is this. I can't tell you when the right timing is to follow up with that potential client again, because you're the one that built the rapport for two or three hours. You've been following back up and forth with them. Only you know that, right? And so one of the things with part of the scripting that we do is we never leave a call without asking, hey, you know, after you give them your update or whatever the case is, hey, um, just so that I don't forget about you, when is the best time for me to touch base again? And they're the only ones that would know that. Again, that would be too hard to track for me. But going back to the simplicity of that follow-up is because of that, all my expectation is, is when I go do verify that lead, I just want to see those two things. I want to see an updated note and I want to see a future follow-up. And as long as you know I, I randomly check the three and they're there, then they're eligible for that particular uh, flip. I like that. That is way simpler than I even thought. That's awesome. And you, and you have trust with your agents and the, and the expectation is clear for them. It's a yes or no. Are you following up? Um, so we were talking, obviously you said you're setting all of these appointments for them. You're teeing it up for them. How are you filtering out tire kicker leads? How are you like, what are you doing to filter out those? Okay. So one of the things that I, I, I think we should set up first is I started with online leads on the retail side and I've made all the mistakes that you could possibly make when it comes to lead sources mm -hmm. and not giving them enough time to convert. And so that really helped me out when it comes to these cash offer leads. Um, so one of the things that um, I, I've noticed is that when, when we're talking about lead conversion and we're talking about solid appointments for either an investor or an agent is it's a lot of it is going to come down to the initial phone call and the questions that you're asking um, but more importantly, making sure that, um, you know, these people are at a point to where they're ready to go. And I think one of the things that happens with a lot of people that sign up for lead sources, specifically online lead sources, is that everybody wants that lead source that's about that's on the two yard line that can, you know, they're about mm -hmm. to punch it in. And unfortunately, yeah. that's really not the case. Right. So when we talk about lead sources, one of the things that I've noticed is I, I try to set up my business that to have both because I, I agree that there's lead sources out there that have the type of leads that are ready to go right now. So, for example, those are going to be you know people that call in for my radio ad or people that call in for my direct mail. Those typically are the ones that are ready to go right now. And I love those. Unfortunately, that's not all of my business. Um, it, it's a certain portion of it. The other portion is going to be long-term nurturing leads. And that's where I feel, it, depending on your budget, where a lot of um, agents and investors fall into, right? They fall into, I have these long-term nurturing leads. And when I go to conferences or I talk to other agents or investors, one of the things that I constantly hear is, oh, that, that lead sort sucks or those don't work. The Facebook leads don't work. And it, it's so further from the truth because just asking them a few questions, you can tell automatically they don't have stuff set up for lead conversion. Uh, what they have set up is what everyone's mindset is. And that, that's the quick fix. That's the, everybody wants that lead source that, you know, you're going to go to the house and they're going to, they're going to sign. Um, and so one of the things that I'm really hardcore on is giving the lead sources the due time to see if the conversion works. 
Now, the only way this works is if you track it. But the number two thing is making sure that when I sign up for a lead source, I want it for at least eight to 12 months. I want to make sure that I have reserves for eight to 12 months of the lead source. And the reason why I want that is because mm. I want to stay in curiosity during those eight to 12 months. I don't want to jump to conclusions because the nice thing about our business is if one lead converts, that could mean thousands. We're not talking hundreds here. And if you're flipping it, that could be hundreds, hundreds of thousands. So just having the patience and also staying in curiosity for eight to 12 months on any lead source will go such a long way for you because I've quit lead sources too soon and I've kept lead sources too long before. So um, that's really big, but more importantly, um, that's what's helped me out in regards to making sure that, you know, if I'm signing up for a new lead source or if it's an online lead that I'm giving it, it it's due time. As far as the appointments you're setting for the agents, are you are you setting them up with only specific lead sources or certain types of leads, or are you taking any of those on? So one of the things that I have found out is I, I never want to be reliant on one agent or one lead source. So one of the things that I do is the, the mindset of a salesperson is so very important, and it can be also fragile at times. And one mm -hmm. of the things that happens is that we all go off of momentum, meaning that if the, the agent doesn't have enough small victories over time, their mindset goes bad and then your leads are bad. So mm -hmm. one of the things that I'm hardcore on is I can't just take the solid. I could go run out there with every solid lead and take it myself and convert it I, like that's not a big deal. But one of the things that it's not really a sacrifice because I think they're generally helping me and I'm helping them is if it's a radio lead, if it's a PPC lead, if it's a solid direct mail lead that just came in, I want to make sure that they're fed first because that goes a lot longer for me. I'll go out there and I always mm. try to keep a rotation of three to five retail listings at a time going and um, whatnot. But it's more important for me that they get these solid leads because I know what it turns into is their mindset is different. Now, there's going to be some appointments that don't go well, which is fine. But if if too many bad appointments happen at one point, then everything else becomes bad in their whole life, right? Because they don't have enough small victories to go off of. So I'm very, very intentional making sure that they get enough solid at bats. But I also track everything, too. I track all my appointments. They all have their own separate um tracking sheet that I keep track of. And I keep track of how many appointments that they're taking per week. Um, but to go back to your question, I think not enough attention is paid to that. One of the things that mm. I personally do is after every single appointment, there's a couple of things that they do for me is I always tell them, hey, put the notes in and CC me. But a lot of them, every single time they're done with the appointment will call me and I'll ask them the 20 questions and it'll take about a 20 minute phone call. But I'm really zeroing in on stuff that they're saying, because as the market shifts like it's doing now, it's important for me to have insight. Not only does their insight help me out, it helps me out when I'm setting the appointment, but also helps me out when I'm tweaking my marketing as well. And I really do care how that appointment went. I really do care if a seller was upset because they thought they were going to get a cash offer that day. I really do care what responses they're saying to that particular client because that's all part of the conversion, but it's also part of me listening and saying, hey, you know what? Where's their mindset at? Because without a good mindset, especially salespeople, you could give them the best leads and they could mm -hmm. screw them up just because they just haven't had you know, solid appointments. So um, that, that's some of the, the ways that I kind of dictate how they um, get the leads, but also more importantly, the feedback that they're providing me. But to kind of sum it up is it is so important that you're you're that you're not setting up, you know, wood type of appointments where it's not going to go anywhere because too many of those and the, they'll leave you. It's like th he's wasting my time. And so the guys that have been with me for 10 to 12 years, I respect their time. Their time is worth a lot of money. And I want to make sure that um, they're in front of people that um, are ready to go and obviously either on the retail side or the um, investment side. I like that. No, that, that makes sense. And I, you're, you're, uh, I like what you said about not relying on one particular agent or one type of agent, but also not on one lead source. And that's kind of what we teach at Carrot is like, you know, start with one marketing method and get it nailed down, like get it cranking, get your ROI from it, and then stack on another. And of course, they're all going to like, 
any marketing method works. You can do any of them. They all work to some extent, uh, but you need the varied ones. Um, you can't put all of your eggs in one basket. Um, we found that uh, we, we ran a survey to over 100 customers. Oh, it was probably six, eight months ago at this point um, on lead to deal conversion. We found that the SEO leads were uh, over seven times more profitable and closing faster than uh other marketing methods. And so the SEO, the PPC leads, the radio ones, like you said, like the really specific pointed speaking to their mindset, uh, they convert really well. Um, you had mentioned, uh, your agents knowing what, basically what frame of mind the seller is in. What, what's the, so for an, for an agent who isn't familiar with these, uh, the really motivated leads, like the cash offer leads, what, what do you feel is the biggest mindset shift that they need to make in order to, to even just like have a successful conversation with a motivated seller? So I think one of the things with online leads is I, I think the initial call is so important. And if you've never dealt with a lot of online leads before, you got to go in there, you got to get beat up a little bit, you got to get smacked around a little bit. But if you're really good and you're willing to stick with it long enough, you can see um, the fruits of your labor. So with one of the things that I do on the front end is when I initially call the lead, I, I want to make sure that I call it within the first 48 seconds or less. And in the Phoenix market, you have no choice. You have to go get the, you have to get to them quickly. Um, I'm glad you said seconds. You said 48. I'm like, don't you say 48 hours. They're no. gone. Well, the reason why, at that point. <laughs> here's the reason why I chose the number 48 is in a crime scene, you have 48 hours, right? Before then there, the, the chances go way down for, mm. you know, to figure out, you know, who, who committed the crime with leads specifically. And I, I see this a ton is p people pay so much in leads. I always think like if they literally, when a lead comes in, if they literally had $200, $300, $400 bills in cash and they threw it in the garbage, they would treat those leads differently. So I'm very hardcore on if I can't mm. be by my phone, I, I forward my phone uh, to my assistant to make sure that she's answering the phone. But the biggest thing is getting to the lead, like getting the lead within 48 seconds or less. And it has to be quick because that is your best chance at conversion. Um, another thing that um, I, I, I picked up on, it was actually from your uh, podcast was like, I will call them four times in a row because the, the chances mm. of conversion right there that, that's your best shot. That, that That is absolutely your best shot. And I, I see so, uh, a, a lot of people waste leads on, um, on, on the real estate side, on the retail side, and even on the investor side where they're finally getting around to the lead. Um, and it's unexcusable for the amount of money that you spend on them. Um, and you're again, going back to what we were talking about before, you're not giving it the best shot at conversion if you're not doing that. So the 48 second rule is huge in my book. That's the most important part when the lead comes in. And then the second part of the actual lead is the nice part about uh, the hybrid model is I, I really don't have any type of motivation um, when I'm talking to the lead from a standpoint. I'm not trying to direct them either way, right? I'm not trying to tell them they should go to the retail side and list it, but I'm also not trying to pigeonhole them into you know taking a cash offer. And I think because I'm able to stay in curiosity with the actual phone call, that helps me out a ton because I'm just listening. And w one of the things with uh, where I think Again, I don't think you need to have any special um, script. I, I think if if you are good at asking questions, you can get all the information that you want. I want a lot of my phone calls to be 20, 30, 40 minutes long, because the longer mm. I spend on the phone with these particular cash offer leads, the better chance I have an idea of where they stand. Is it worthy of an appointment? Is the timing off right now? Um, and then I... I'm I'm just getting a lot of good insight on them, but the best part is I'm I really don't care what direction they go because in my mind I know that when my agents go out there or if I go out there myself, I already know I have the two best options for them. And one of the things that we say a lot with our appointments is we're one of the very few companies in the whole state that actually go over both options with you. And the reason for that is I know a lot of home sellers they want to know what they can get on the cash offer, but they also want to know you know, if they wanted to maximize the amount of equity they can get from their property. So um, th those are a couple of things that have helped me when it comes to lead conversion. But more importantly, um, you know, making sure that you're calling them quick, but also not rushing them off the phone. Like, th I think that's a huge thing right there, because, again, I want to give the, the, the lead source the best shot at conversion. 
Um, and I think that's the best way to do it with the online stuff. Hmm. Well, I like the contrast there. It's like, obviously speed to lead is like, you can't stress that enough speed to lead 48 seconds. And then, but the contrast is you're not rushing them to get off the phone. So you, I like how you mentioned, um, or how you worded that stay in curiosity. So it's like, get to them as fast as possible, but then, you know, stay on with them as long as possible, as long as necessary to understand them, make them feel heard. Um, so what's the script like for your agents? What, like, what are the questions they're asking? Cause you had mentioned, you know, ask as many questions as possible. What, what are the questions they need to be asking? So first things first, when you first get on the phone with a particular lead, one of the things that will kill any good phone call is kids and noise and they're not ready for it. Meaning, do you have a couple of minutes? And I make them answer, yes, this is a good time. So as long as um, they're in a position, the seller's in a position to talk to me, perfect, this is gonna be a good phone call. And one of the things that you'll notice is people treat their houses like kids, meaning like they wanna talk about them. And <laughs> what you perceive as, like a non-upgrade, it's the biggest upgrade to them, even if it was done in early 2000s. And one of the things that I never rush is when I'm on the phone with these particular sellers is after they confirm, yeah, I have a couple of minutes, I go directly into, hey, what are some of the upgrades that you've done to the home? And I keep poking at that question and I want everything. And even though I already know the bedrooms and baths and the square footage, I'm confirming all the basic stuff. Those are my easy questions. I go into the upgrades, but I want them to keep talking. And I'm constantly asking, hey, is there anything else that you can think of that you've done with the home? And the thing that's helped me out specifically with these leads, and this is a really good tip, is people will talk to you more if they perceive you care, meaning that as I'm talking to a seller and they're route, they're, um, you know, giving me all their upgrades, the one thing that's helped me out a ton and they will stick on the phone with me forever on this is they'll be like, um, oh, I put granite in and I uh, put a new roof in, and I got a new AC. And then I'll always say, Hey, whoa, slow down, slow down. I'm trying to write all this down. And then I'll repeat it back. Granite. Okay. And they put AC on. Okay. What year was the AC? And they, in their mind, cause we're not on zoom, they physically can see it in their head. Oh my gosh, mm -hmm. he's writing this stuff down. Oh, well, if you're writing that down, hey, don't forget about my water softener I put in in 2004. Oh, by the way, I totally forgot. I planted this little fig tree in the backyard and I'm eating mm. it up because I know that during that phone call, it's a sense of trust and rapport because at the very end, if you've done a really good uh, enough job is let's say it's 20 minutes later and you're finally done with the upgrades. They feel so comfortable with you. And I'm going to revert back to this. It's just like their kids because it's like they were talking about their kid for 20 minutes and how proud they are of him. How does that make them feel after that? They're going to feel like, oh my gosh, like I feel really good. And this guy oh, yeah, cares yeah. and he's writing it down. And I, and I can't stress this point enough is when you're on the phone with these particular leads, writing it down and murmuring and like kind of whispering it back to them is gold. They absolutely will eat it up and they will keep talking. And you know you've done a good job when they start mentioning stuff that aren't even upgrades. My house has a ceiling. You know, like it, it's stuff like that <laughs> where you, you know, you can get to that point. But again, going back to your yeah. original question, that helps out on conversion because now, you know, as we're going through the phone call, then it's just a tee up towards the end. Um, but um, I have a couple of questions at the very end that I asked to kind of segue into the appointment. But um, that's how I set up the first part of the call. I like that. It's, I mean, you're, you're asking those questions and they're, you, you know, you're building that trust with them. And then they're, when they feel understood, like you said, when they feel understood, it's like, you know, them, they, you know, from the seller's perspective, like me, I'm, I'm feeling like the seller as you're walking through the script, it's like, oh, this guy understands my situation down to a T. So in my head, I can trust you to make a decision that's in my best interest. The decision being, I'm going to point you towards uh, either a cash offer or retail. You know, there's that trust there that you're not going to pigeonhole me, you know, or take me for my money. Yeah. And I think a, a lot of times too is sellers sometimes get to the point where they totally forgot that they put their information in for a cash offer. And the mm. reason why I know that is because they've already talked to three, four, five, ten other investors before me. And I already know how their calls go whether they're too quick or they just could care less about anything else. So that's helped me out a ton, that first part of the call, especially when you're just listening. Hmm. Interesting. So what are, um, 
What are some of the questions towards the end that you're asking them before you set that appointment? So a, a few questions that I think are very powerful towards the end of the appointment is after they get done through their whole upgrades, um, my segue question is, wow, this really sounds like a nice house. Um, are you thinking about moving out of state or are you just going to stay here around in Phoenix? And then they tell you, hey, you know, here's here's here are the here are the next plans. Um, another powerful question towards the end is, hey, John, um, how long have you actually been thinking about possibly moving? Has it just been recently or have you been thinking about it for quite some time? And typically with that question, it actually spurs a lot of good insight. And sometimes I was speaking to a, a lead two days ago and their response to me was, well, I just found out that I got prostate cancer. So this was mm. never expected. I was never planning on doing this. This was expected. But it also allows me to know, because I always judge if I'm about to set up an appointment, I, I need to know what is there a good enough reason why they're trying to move, right? I don't want it to be like, oh, I'm just trying to figure out who will give me the you know best cash offer. Because if they don't need to move, then I don't want to waste my agent's time when heading out there. So it's a very powerful question. And I really key in on that in regards to, um, you know, is this something spur of the moment or does something happen in your life? Job relocation, you know, something with my health or my my parents are, are not feeling good. I have to go move closer to them. Um, and then last but not least, um, my last question to them um, is, hey, one of the things that we do is we actually confirm the condition of every home to make sure that we get you as close to market value as possible. Um, are you going to be around the next couple of days to actually meet and show me the house? And then pause. And one of the things too is that's important for me because I'm seeing if they're going to push back. I, I, I want to see if they're looking for something over the phone. Because one of the things that a lot of people got used to over the past two years, and we're not seeing it as much now, is iBuyers and um, other investors were just giving offers over the phone. And they could do that because, you know, you could give any offer and then put it on the market and make money from it. But now I'm seeing that less and less as I'm talking to mm -hmm. home sellers. Um, but it's very important for us. But one of the key things to that particular question when you're setting up the appointment is it has to be logical why you're coming over. Because sometimes with these cash offer leads, they, you know, it's a hoarder house where they just don't want anybody in it. But you still got to get in front of them because I think there's huge value there. And that's one of the reasons why, if you notice in the question, it's, hey, one of the things that we do is we confirm the condition so that we can get you as close to market value as possible. And then it clicks to them like, oh, well, I do want close to market value. And so it's logical, the reason why I'm trying to set up the appointment that way. Um, and then, of course, like I was talking about, I, again, I'm trying to see if there's any pushback at that point. Hmm. Oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Sorry, I'm just like, yeah. I'm slow to respond. You're catching me off guard because I'm like, <laughs> I'm in the house seller's shoes. I'm like, he's got me. I'm like, what do I, what do I say next? I'm like, I need to sell this guy my house. I don't even have, to ha I don't even have a house to sell. Hmm. So one of the things, too, is, again, I... I want to make sure these appointments are solid. So I want to make sure when I'm setting up the appointment, I'm putting the seller in a position to where it looks like I'm busy, but I'm not begging for the appointment. And so I put the ball in their court without them knowing it. For example, one of the things that I do is, okay, Sally, so she's committed to meeting with me. So, you know, I'll just go, hey, you know what? Um, what are typically the days and times that you're both available to me? Because I want both decision makers there or if it's just her. And they'll be like, oh, Tuesdays. And I'll be like, well, what time were you thinking? And then they'll be like, typically around 4.30 when I get off work. Perfect. Let me just check my schedule. And again, it goes back to talking back into the phone. Okay, let me see. Tuesday, what do I have? What? Do I, oh, you know what? Actually, you know what? Would five o'clock work? Oh, perfect. Okay, great. That works. And then when I said it, I asked this very important question because again, I want to make sure that I take my business serious and they know that too. Hey, Sally, can you do mm. me a huge favor? Sure. What's that? Um, could you, if something comes up, would you be able to call or text me just so that I know? Oh, absolutely. I would do that for you. And then I say, you know what, Sally, I'm going to go ahead and uh, text you over my information right now. So you have my cell phone. Um, but before I, you know, let you go, is there any other questions I can um, answer for you? And then, no, I don't. Okay, perfect. Anything pops up, let me know. Um, and then one of the things is, again, is the day of the appointment or the night before, I make sure that I'm sending a confirmation text to make sure that they'll be there and that they're ready for the appointment. Mm. Is that something you're doing manually, right? It, yep. It's not an automated thing. You're actually human being touching base with them. Um, so I wanted to ask when you, when you ask that question, like, Hey, are you going to be around for the next couple of days? I feel like, correct me if I'm wrong. Are you waiting to see if you get like a pause? If there's that has is like, is that a signal tells you something? If it's long, awkward pause, like, uh, or if it's like, Oh yeah, I'll be here. You know, does that I matter? Th 
I it actually does matter because I think one of the things that with that particular question it actually helps me gauge how serious they are about selling their home. If people are really serious, they will go to the ends of the earth to do whatever you need them to do to get their home sold. Mm. And one of the things that I've noticed is sometimes when they don't want people over and sometimes it's because, you know, they're embarrassed or whatever of the particular house. But a lot of times when they're like, oh, we're not ready to meet just yet, then that's the indicator that oh, that's all I need to know when it comes to. Okay, they're not their time frame isn't in the next couple of weeks. It's more likely six, eight months down the road. And they'll proactively tell you that, hey, that's the reason why I don't want to meet right now is because, oh, I still have to talk to my or I haven't even told my wife yet that we're doing this. So there's a lot of <laughs> stuff that comes out from that question. But I am looking for pushback and preferably I'd want the pushback right then and there on the phone call so that I can either dissect it a little bit more, ask a couple more questions or just really find out like, well, how serious are they? Um, or are they just kind of looking for something over the phone um, as far as the cash offer? Mm. That goes back to what we were talking about earlier. That's one of the ways that you're saving your agent's time and trying to filter out some of those leads and get their motivation sooner. Right. And it's, and sometimes people over the phone, they want to know sometimes like, well, you, what would you offer me? Like, you know, what what's that? And the nice part, again, I'm an agent, so I have access to, um, you know, tax records and comms. And even when I'm talking to clients, I can see exactly what's been selling in like 20 seconds because, um, you know, we have the MLS and the, and the tax records. But I'm able to actually because I know what they want to hear. They don't want me to, you know, if the homes are selling for 400, they don't want me to say, oh, we're going to offer you three, 325. I, I tell them exactly, hey, wh what's my range that my, you know, that you can get for my house. And I, I'm able to say, hey, you know what, right now, based off what's been selling, it looks like you're between, it's a very broad range, 350 to 425. Um, and then as long as, because again, I know where their market's at, as long as it's within that range, it's like, oh, okay, I guess I'll meet with you. Uh, because again, they don't want you to waste your time uh, as well, but I already know what's going to happen on the back end on the appointment, um, being able to go over both options. Mm, I love that. So it sounds like you've got your process dialed in now. You obviously, you've been doing this for a while. You've got your, your negotiation, your scripts dialed in, you've trained your agents well. Um, but what happens when the leads don't cover, when they don't pan out and like, how is like all of these things that you're telling me right now, how does it different from when you first started out? Like, what did you learn in the early stages? I think one of the things, if I, if I compared myself to when I first started out is a lot of times when things don't convert is I haven't taken enough at bats to get my conversion down right when I'm in front of people. But more importantly, I think one of the things too is sales in general is tricky. Like running your own business is tricky. And one of the things with, I think with, um, the leads, and I know we've kind of touched on this before is I wouldn't give leads the, the due diligence that they need, the time frame that they need for the conversion. But more importantly, I never had systems set up, um, to allow conversion to happen. And my systems are not overly complicated at all. They're very simplistic. In fact, um, the systems that have helped me out on lead conversion, and it's different for everybody is. Um, one of my hardcore systems is I'm always following up with my online leads from nine to 12 every single day. And then I pick one night out of the week and I'll call them at night as well. That system has made me more money than any other system. And I know mm. a lot of people don't like doing that. I don't consider them cold calls because I've paid for that particular lead. Um, and I've already, you know, touched base with them, but that follow-up system, if you're committed, um, will make you so much money. I, when I go to conferences and I talk to other investors and agents and I, I'm trying to see if they're just doing the basic stuff for conversion and they're not. And um, so, hey, this lead sort sucks or hey, these don't work. But yet they, they don't even have something basic in place like that. Now, that's more of a habit for me now because I've been do, you know dealing with online leads for a while now. But it, it's really it's one of those things from nine to 12. I already know what I'm doing. It's the most profitable time of my day. And then again, my constant reminder is this. And we talked about this before. Um, we came on the podcast is I've had a couple of leads the past couple of months that recently have closed that I was following up for three years. It was worth every single <laughs> minute of follow up on when, when they converted. Um, and so that's the first system that I would, you know, tell anyone in regards to that's that I, I did not have that in place over the last 10 years. I've had that in place and it's made me, you know, a, a ton of money, but that simplistic system from nine to 12 is I'm always calling and following up with the particular leads. It's a habit. It's a schedule. If you're not, if you're not doing that from nine to 12, are you passing that off to someone on your team or your assistant? 
No. So, and I've had um, a, a lead, um, a head of leads before. I've had a couple of them. And, you know, I've always toggled back and forth if, if I want to hand it off. I don't mind doing it. I, I just don't. It just doesn't bother me. I, I know some people just absolutely probably are cringing as they hear me talk about calling from nine to 12. It doesn't bother me. Like it just does not. I come from a call center background. Um, so for me, um, it's it's not a big deal. But to answer your question, no, I, I don't pass that off or I haven't passed it off in the last uh, few years. Hmm. Well, it's like, I, I think people, I can see how people would cringe at that, like, oh, three hours of calling. But to me, like, that's much more sexy than a bunch of random follow-up all the time. And of course, you're still going to be following up at other parts of the day of the week. But it's like, I'd rather, you know, put in three hours a day at a set time and know that the results are going to be somewhat more predictable than just random follow-up or lackluster follow-up. So when I listen to podcasts, specifically investor podcasts, I think a lot of people perceive uh, calling or following up is with cold leads. And there's a market for that to where you just grab a dialer and you just dial. The leads that I'm following up with, I've paid for. And I've already, mm -hmm. a lot of them I've already talked to. And so uh, another interesting question is, well, what am I saying to these leads as I'm following up so I'm not annoying them? Um, and so that's... Yeah. You know, we can go into that if you want, but I, I yeah. think people's perception is a little bit off too. And I, I think that's why it doesn't bother me as much because I've already paid thousands for these leads. I've already talked to a lot of them. So it's not like out of the phone book or I'm on a dialer and I'm just calling random houses. It's not that type of follow-up and it's not that type of calling. So I, I yeah, I do want to know what you're saying to not annoy them. And like, if there's a difference between what you're saying when you call like a Google ads PPC lead versus, uh, um, I don't know, any other lead. So one of the things with, with these online leads is the, the initial call, you have to stick to the script of why they came through. So that, and that goes back to what we were talking about before is when, you know, when I initially call, Hey, you know, Brady, you just put your information in for a cash offer in your home on Brent street. You have two minutes. So I stick with the script. That's pretty simplistic. Where I make a lot of my money is the follow-up through a more simplistic script. One of the cool things about these cash offer leads is over time, they forget why you guys were even talking initially. <laughs> and that's where I'm able to transition my agent side of stuff to um, you know, my, my follow-up. So I'm going to give you a, a simplistic script. It works like gold. And I want you to um, keep in mind that... Keep in mind the seller has totally forgot the last time you spoke what you talked about. They just, they totally forget. They forget how you got your information. They forget what uh, website they put it in. They've talked to, you know, 10, 15, 20 other investors. And so when mm. I'm following up, my simplistic script is this. Hey, John. Oh yeah, this is John. Hey, John, it's Phil. Pause. Oh, hey, oh, hey Phil. Hey, I promised to call you today with a quick market update for your property on Elm Street. Pause. Um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. This home just sold like two doors down and I wanted to uh, email it to you. Um, are you still at the gmail.com email? And then once it, cause remember the, the, they're like, what the who? Well, he promised to call me when, <laughs> what, what? But here's the one thing people love, 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 love. What do people go check? Like it's their stock. They go oh, to yeah. the Zestimate. They go yeah, to yeah. Zillow. They want to know where their home is priced at. And it's funny, I, it, I have clients that check every single day. And so one of the things I know with this follow-up, the reason why it's so effective is two things. Number one, remember, they don't remember your first conversation if it was just cash. Second, when they hear market update for my house, well, okay, I'll, yeah, I, sure, I'll take the market update. Yeah, what did, the, what did it sell for? And when you're able to email that to them and you're providing a piece of value, like, hey, here's the reason for my call, it's market update, 99% of people aren't going to be like, oh, how dare you give me an, a lot of them are like, oh yeah, because they're all nosy. They all want to know like what just sold. What's the one thing I didn't find on Zillow. And when they confirm, I can email it to their email address when they're like, yeah, go ahead and send it. Yeah. I'm still at the gmail.com. They're proactively telling you to, you know, send them the information. That's when you can follow up with, Hey, I promised to check in with you today in regards to uh, your property. Are you still thinking about selling or have you put that on hold for a little bit? And then that just opens up the conversation and it can open up floodgates. Well, you know, last time we, sp and again, it's funny how they start talking to you because in their mind, their thing is like, I I've talked to this guy before. I have no clue who he is, 
but they start opening up. Well, we actually put the home on, you know, it's on hold for right now. You know, Sally had to have her tumor removed or whatever the case is. So that's the simplistic follow-up that I do. It's very effective. It's very simple. But again, understanding that they don't remember what you talked about initially because they've already talked to multiple agents and investors at that point. Mm, I love that, man. It, I mean, it's similar to, I was just talking with Chris Bello on a podcast. It'll be coming out in a, a couple months from now, but we were talking about email marketing and how he's got really good open rates, really click through rates, and he's built a, a valuable list of over a thousand people. And I was like, well, what are you, what are you doing to get people engaged? And like, how do you get people to respond? And, and he's like, well, I'm just sharing with them, you know, what I learned on my podcast this last week, who I talked with, what's going on in my personal life. And I'm sharing things that I think might be helpful for them. And the same thing is happening in this, this phone call with you. You're, you're calling them, providing them with value, which is literally the complete opposite for like nine other out of 10 other phone calls that they would get, you know, outside of family and friends. And so you're calling and saying, Hey, I have this thing for you. I want you to know, and you've piqued their curiosity and you're giving them something that's valuable to them. Whereas anyone else is calling and saying, Hey, I just want to know if you'll sell your home. You're just asking, like nobody wants to pick up their phone and just like be asked to do something or about something like well, I think another big thing too, though, is it, when I say like my my agents need small victories, the if you're following up with clients, you as the person that it, it, that own the business or you're the salesperson or you're the, you know, whatever you are, you need small victories yourself. And one of the things that I, I found is sometimes when you find something that works this good on follow up, um, you be you, you start getting small victories, but more importantly, they start welcoming your phone calls. And one of the things that I've heard multiple times with appointments, and my agents will tell me this too, is um, the reason why I went with you, because that's one of the questions I ask my agents when they're done with the appointment, What, what, why did they decide to go with us? Is Phil would call me and it wasn't annoying. He always had some sort of value. There was no angle. I wasn't trying to close them. And that goes a long way because people, what they do is they either block you or they put you in their phone. And if you can make it into their phone, it's a welcome phone call because I know when he calls, it's it's a market update and he he always emails me the house that just sold and it's and I can be open with them and I can be honest with them in regards to timeframes and stuff. So that, you know, that, that's pretty key with with these types of follow ups is trying to follow up with people without the annoyance. But more importantly, you want the phone call to be effective for yourself, too. Right. You want to make sure that you're leading, you know, this th there's a, sh a shot at conversion at one point. Mm. Absolutely. I'd pick up the phone call. I mean, I don't know how many times my wife and I are driving to the car and I'm like, oh, that house around the street just, I wonder what that sold for, you know? I'm not going to look it up on Zillow <laughs> while I'm driving and wreck my car, but I want to know. I'd answer that. Um, well, cool, man. That That's that's a golden script. Thanks for sharing that. That's super creative. And I, I just love the whole value-driven approach with that. Um, really quick on that, if I can end it, just just to make sure that I can provide as much value as possible is... One of the things that it, if you're going to do that type of follow up, that make sure you ask this last question before you leave the phone mm. call. Hey, just so I don't forget about you, when did you want me to touch base again? And if if they give you a few months out, always cut that in half. If they give you two weeks out, just call them in two weeks. But I always cut everything in half. And one of the things is it goes back to the simplistic of the system, simplicity of the system is they will always say, you know what, we're we're about to make a decision. Call me back in you know, in three months. And in my mind, I'm like, well, I don't want you to make a decision without me. So I'll call him back in like a month. Um, yeah. But uh, again, th the follow-up is only effective is if not only are you committed, but more importantly, making sure that, that you get a commitment from them. Because remember, when you call them back, that's one of the things that you're going to initially say is, hey, I promise to call you back. That's showing that, hey, I take my job serious. But more importantly, you're important to me. I, I, you, you wanted me to call you back on the 19th of October. I'm calling you back. And they, the people notice that people notice like, you know what? Dang it. I can't get mad at the guy. Cause I freaking told him. I, I do remember telling him to call me back. <laughs> You've asked for their permission. You're sending that expectation. I like that. And, and you didn't say, Hey, you know, I'm going to follow up with you if it's okay. You're not assuming. Hmm. I love that, man. You, it's funny. You're like, so a uh, personally, I hate sales. I have, um, <laughs> I hate it. You know, yeah. <laughs> I got my, ins I, I, I'll say this on the podcast. I got mm -hmm. my insurance license, my insurance producer's license for mm -hmm. life and health, property and casualty. Yeah. And I, I'm the only person I know that's got their insurance license and never sold a single policy. 
<laughs> I was terrible. I was terrible. I, I, hate, I hated the cold calling. I hated the conversations. I always hate feeling salesy. Um, it's the uh, self-awareness. Yeah. You know what's funny about that topic, yeah. though, is I, I think with the consumer in general, I think we've all become so smart because of the internet. And I think one of the things yes. that you can't downplay is people can tell the sincerity of you through your voice tone and your mm -hmm. angles. And I think one of the things like, and trust me, I, I, I'm with you. Like what, before I got into real estate, I'm like, I don't want to do sales. I just, I hate it when people try to sell me. There's a way to do sales that feels natural, that comes across natural. But more importantly, it's always at an angle of what can I do to help them? And I think once you can, right. can grasp that concept, it, it makes it um, way better. Right. And well, that's why I brought that up because like, as I'm listening to you, I'm like, wow, it's, like his, his, Phil's got me interested in sales right now. Like, oh, I could do this. And it's like, it's interesting. It's like, what you're saying is that, um, like there's always going to be tactics. There's always going to be sales and negotiation tactics, but one, you can't lead with the tactics first. Like, uh, tactics will always undermine a serv undermine a servant's heart, you know, and just wanting to help people. And also you, you gotta have good tactics. Like the tactics you're using aren't just like little psychological tricks. I mean, they kind of are, but they're, you know, um, they're ethical tactics and they're not, you don't leave with the, the tactics first, you know? Yeah. And I, I think one of the things too, as consumers is because they know, right. That a salesperson is going to call them. I think a lot of them, especially when you're talking about the cash offer leads, keep in mind that they probably just went to five or six other websites. So there's going to be five or six other calls before you or after you. And one of the things that will always stand out to the consumer is the conversation that you had, because that conversation goes so far. Like be, if they had such a good conversation with you and they've invested the phone time with you, one thing that I notice is that they don't get back to the other people that were touching base with them. They just want to stick with you because in that phone call, and that's the reason why I think the, the initial call is so important is they get to the point where if you've done such a good job, they'll proactively go, well, what's the next step? What, what, what do we do next? And in their mind, they've already shut down. You know what? I filled out four other websites today. I, I don't want to spend another 45 minutes. I, I like this guy. This guy listens and they, they get so comfortable that sometimes we're the only appointment because of the initial call, even though, and I know this mm. for a fact, they filled out four or five other um, sites. And it just goes down to kind of what you were alluding to is nothing in that conversation or initial phone call was salesy. I don't have, um, I'm not trying to pigeonhole them into doing a certain thing that they don't want to do. And the better you are at asking questions, the, like th they notice that they notice that like, wow, like he really cares that, you know, the reason why we're moving. And mm. as they're answering their questions, I'm even digging more deep. I'm like, you know, well, who, who's out in Indiana? Oh, that's where my kid, you know, it, it, it's stuff that um, it, it just breaks it down so much to where their defenses um, go down. And then more importantly, um, you can get yourself in a position to where it's like they leave that phone call feeling really good. Mm. I love that. Um, I get one other question and then we'll talk about, you know, any resources you might have where people can uh, find you, whatever. But um how do you, uh, how are you making the seller feel like they're getting the best of both, both worlds, especially like with your hybrid model, you've got the cash offer retail. Um, when they pick one, they might feel like they're missing out. So how do you make them feel otherwise? So I think one of the big things is, um, I learned this the hard way is people don't want to know you have your real estate license initially. And so there's two separate companies that I've set up and I treat them like separate companies too. I have go fast offer. And then I have go sold homes and my go sold homes is my retail stuff. So if you go there, we're just talking about retail because that's the reason why you went there. And my go fast offer is just cash that you're only here for the cash offer. And so the question becomes, how are you marrying the two to where they perceive that I'm getting the best of both worlds? Well, first things first, you have to get in front of them. If, if you're not in front of them to go over this and understand their best interest, then they're never going to feel that way. And so one of the things that um, that my agents are trained on is the most important skill that you can ever build when you're going on these appointments is rapport. Why is rapport so important? Spend an hour, spend two hours on rapport building because at the very end, that gives you the best opportunity to go over both options with the client. Because at the end of the day, if we can go over both options, then they can decide on which one. Now, going back to your question, well, how does the client know that they're not getting, you know, cheated out is 
if they want a cash offer and that's all they want, we're going to provide that. But more importantly, I always tell this to clients is when you go on the open market, that gives you the best shot to not only pull the investors out of the woods and their cash people and the regular buyers as well. Now, the best, uh, the best part about that is now you can compare the two and go to sleep at night knowing that you chose the best possible option, but you didn't leave any money on the table. And one of the things that really the biggest pushback when it comes to the open market, I don't want people trudging through my home. Not an issue because we can actually just pick one or two um, days out of the week to show it. And you can pick the, the hours that you want to do that as well. Um, but more importantly, they always, because you know a lot of these end up being retail listings, is they feel good like regardless of what decision they decide that if if I do do retail, I get cash and I get um, you know regular buyers. If, if I'm strictly just doing the cash option with Phil, then it's always going to be as is. Um, and you know, it's, it's a quick close and there's no showings. Hmm. I love that. I think that's a great way. And you know, I didn't expect like half of that answer was just, was just the rapport. You've put so much time into that relationship building, the, the rapport. And so that trust is there already. They, they know they're not going to cheat it out because they trust you. Yeah. And I, I think so if, if you're comparing the phone call to the actual appointment, like the phone call sometimes has to mirror the appointment, meaning like if, if, if I had built good rapport and if it's me or another agent that's showing up to the particular house, I want to make sure that that rapport is still there, even with, with a different agent, because the only way to gain people's trust is not only the rapport, but rapport essentially is saying, I care about your situation and your history. So it's not uncommon that our appointments last two to three hours. But the nice part about it is it gives us the best shot at, you know, having them make a decision um, at the appointment. Hmm. I love that, man. Well, dude, thank you so much for sharing this script. I, I just love that. You like have me in a trance, like I'm the seller. You pull me in, man. Um, but I don't want to sell you my house right now. Yeah. Um, I appreciate you sharing all that. Yeah, until it's done. Once I'm done building it, then I'll sell it to you. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that, man. Um, where can, well, actually one other question, what other, uh, I was going to ask, where can people find you? So answer that in a sec, but are there any resources that like any books training you did early on that help you with these scripts, all this negotiation skills, or is this just trial by fire? No, no, no. It, so here's the one thing, um, uh, a couple of good resources is, um, question-based selling is a really good book. I'm, I'm sure you've heard of that. Um, and then, um, uh, another good book is, um, stop telling, start selling, um, is another mm. good book. And then one guy that I follow, and this really changed my mind shift with the way I did sales. And this was about four and a half years ago is there's a guy named Ricky Carruth. He's on the retail side of stuff, but the, the reason why he's so powerful is everything that we've gone over today he really confirmed with me when I started following him about four and a half years ago that there's a different way to do sales in a way where it's not salesy. And you're just, when you're just strictly trying to make sure that the client is put in a good position, you care about them. It makes it so, so, so easy. And so, um, that's been, uh, he, he was a pretty impactful just from a standpoint of like, Oh, I knew it. I knew you could do sales without, um, you know, a bunch of scripting and a bunch of, um, sales tactics. Yeah. Without the taxes, without being, oh, I love that. Hmm. I'm going to have to look that up. Ricky Carruth. Maybe I can learn to like sales. Yeah, no, you love um, everything that we went over today. He's, he's right up, uh, right up that alley. Where can people find you? Where can people connect with you? Um, best place it would just be Instagram. So again, I have my two Instagram set up. The one is the go fast offer. That's again, if you go there, it'll just look like it's just strictly talking about cash. And then I have my, um, retail, um, Instagram account, which is Phil Shaver, A Z, um, on Instagram. Awesome. Well, sweet, man. Well, thanks for joining us. Appreciate you sharing. Anybody listening, uh, if you have any thoughts, questions for myself or Phil on the podcast, email me, Brady at carrot.com. And don't forget to go to carrot.com slash close, get all of our negotiation follow-up content for the month of October. And uh, thanks everybody for listening and watching. See you later.